All right, everyone, how are you? Excited about this panel? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lapchik. I'm the CEO at Subo and co-founder of Philippine World. We build infrastructure for brands to get into the metaverse. And today we're going to share some of our experiences around connecting physical brands and how we bridge them into the virtual world. So um, let's start with a couple intros. Uh, so say your name, what do you work on, and maybe share one use case that you've been working on in the space. I'm Mark Shackleton. I'm the CEO and founder of Smart Seal Incorporated. So we link physical assets to non-fungible tokens through encrypted NFC tags. Uh, we use that one-to-one -one coupling um, to use for proof of authenticity, uh, proof of possession, uh, and proof of ownership. Hey everyone, I'm Michelle Reeves, co-founder and CEO of Mavion, and a quick shout out to Shama, someone here. Um, I saw that you had your PFP earlier. Thank you, girl. Uh, so we are a fashion NFT, a game-changing fashion NFT that attaches digital assets to limited edition physical items. And simply put, it's royalties for our holders, fashion for our holders, and royalty and income for the designers that we work, uh, work with. So excited to scale scarcity and really work uh, with NFTs to solve problems that Web2 could not. Hello everybody, my name is Joseph Bloch and I'm the NFT and Metaverse Lead at Resolute. We're a full service factory incubation and innovation agency working primarily completely in the NFT and Metaverse sector and touching upon the policy protocols of EPA. And uh, currently we're highly involved in bridging the physical and digital through augmented reality where we do physical shirts and we create augmented reality and we basically create augmented reality designs of our Hi everyone, my name is Chrissy Mashinsky. Um, I started a company in 2020, uh, March 4th, by the name of nycstrong.com with the idea of trying to verify the supply chain locally in New York City. Um, that proved to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, and through that, learned that there was something called blockchain that you could utilize to help verify that supply chain, um, not just you know through our human contact and our, our local communities, but that we could put it on chain. And um, as we verified those products, we put them up onto our website. Folks in Detroit reached out and said, we actually still make things in the US, uh, but we don't really like folks there in New York City. <laughs> we don't want to be on something called NYC Strong. So, we branched out and called it usastrong.io, um, and now we have 400 brands um, helping them to verify authenticity, traceability, um, and we're super excited to be here, and thanks for having us. Awesome, thank you guys. So, when you talk to brands, um, what do you tell them, like, is it urgent for them to start breaching this gap and create breaches between the physical world and the digital world, is it urgent? What are the benefits of, of doing that for those brands? So Michelle, if you wanna, if you wanna start. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so I think with us, we look at Mavion as a real case example. We were four years in the making. Uh, our Web2 company was called The Accessory Junkie, and we were supporting independent designers, there are about 40 million of them around the world, who were left to fend for themselves. They're left to figure out Things like Etsy, they can't understand SEO strategies, and they certainly don't have big marketing budgets to take on established fashion brands. So our job in Web2 was to aggregate this fragmented community, represent 500 independent designers from 26 countries, bring their collections together and drop them through e-commerce, and maybe do collaborations with retailers like Nordstrom. Uh, that was great, but it only got so far, because when you've got these independent designers, you can't scale scarcity. If they make 50 of this earring, that's only 50 earrings. That's a finite transaction. And once those are gone, it's back to the studio to make those items again. And so that continuous cycle of the starving artist has to continue and they have to get a real job because they're people, not machines. So the only way to scale in Web2, as we all know, is to mass produce. But by creating a Web3 platform where we can attach digital assets, 
These earrings can now be digital wearable assets for your avatar. They can be assets in gaming. And those independent designers can drive revenue from those royalties in perpetuity. That's an income stream that changes their side hustle and their passion and their talent into an actual livelihood. So the idea of scaling scarcity is a total revolution when it comes to fashion and manufacturing of, of real goods. That's awesome. So, so when you go to brands and they say, I get this concept of, okay, I need to start producing virtual goods. Do they tell you, hey, that's not my market, like, that's, I'm old, like, I'm an old fashioned brand, like, I don't want to be there, I don't understand it, um, I'm still targeting, like, I don't know, 40 year old people, like. Not at all, it's the opposite. These are creators, but they're used to creating physical tangibles. Uh, so for them, this is exciting. They are looking for solutions that make it easy for them to connect and create more. They don't want to keep making this area. They want to make something new and continue to innovate their craft and now we can take the chains off around their ankles and they can fly and go and do what they do best and we can be their partner supporting that. Cool. Mark, what's the reaction that you get with, with brands usually when you talk about creating this physical bridge into the virtual world? So what we offer is a solution to tokenize a physical asset. Um, the tokens are typically um, used as a proof of authenticity, a certificate of authenticity, and a certificate of ownership um, for that asset. So we've seen um, two different types of classes um, of, of customers come to us. One of them says, listen, we really like NFTs, NFTs are very popular, we want to connect NFTs to our products. And um, that's, that's a more speculative play uh, because you know, you're sort of counting on the collectability of the NFT to bring value to the product. Um, the second class of, pro of um, customers that we see are ones that say like, look, we love blockchain technology um, and we love what it can do. We're looking for an anti-counterfeiting solution. We're looking for a product registration solution. Um, and we don't want our consumers to even know they're touching the blockchain. We don't want to use the words NFT at all. We want to actually abstract that away, but use all the benefits of the blockchain. And we see that as a much more promising, um, you know, way forward. And, and in many ways, it's like it's sort of shielded from the volatility of the market and the speculative, the speculative nature of NFTs because you're just using the chain for, you know, the decentralized applications that you're, you know, you can use it for. Great. Chris, I know you have uh, been working a lot on transparency and how you make supply chains more transparent. When you start bringing NFTs into that equation, like, why do you think those are so important for the work that you do and what's the potential for the fashion industry? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because we have so many brands that want to jump straight to the NFT. And you know, I think that it almost shortchanges the value of what the NFT actually can be long term, right? Because the the value of what is stored there, this 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 data that that brand can essentially own gives them so much more power over their past. And we know what that's worth now, right? We know what our data is worth. Um, and it essentially gives those folks the ultimate reach to the end consumer if they're willing to share that information. And we know historically, US manufacturers have not wanted to do that. They have not wanted to collaborate on that scale. Um, and, and we really are trying to encourage that behavior in a different way as we move forward, is saying, well, if you're really manufacturing here, there are benefits to utilizing this technology and share this information, and there should be rewards at the end of that rainbow, holding that NFT, 
And it's twofold, right? It's not just that manufacturer as the consumer, but it's also the end consumer. And I think that it is complex, but it's giving a lot of folks an opportunity. And I, and I, and I love how you know, we're thinking about it on the stage and how everyone here at this event is thinking about it because it's giving power back to a lot of the manufacturers and a lot of these brands that have been burning cash on ads, right? Because they can't sustain themselves long term paying third parties anymore. And I think this, this thought of the NFT world um, empowers people in such a unique way and our manufacturers are finally understanding, okay, if I want to get to that point, you don't start with the NFT. You got to start over here on A. Then you're going to get that after. And that's kind of how we think about it. Do they come with a team with expertise in blockchain? Do they come with a preconceived idea of what they want to do? Or is usually you start from scratch, this is the strategy, you might have an idea of what to do, but you provide the, the strategy that. It started with scratch, but then the folks, I think, that are real experts in the space that are way more advanced than me have been coming and saying, you know, we're gonna move backwards into what you're doing. We need t-shirts, and we want our t-shirts that are made locally to help our local town, because I grew up in, you know, Utah, and if you've got someone, or Wyoming, we have an amazing community in Wyoming. Um, and if you've got folks there that are actually able to trace back to, you know, where the cotton was grown in North Carolina, you know, let, let's say the, the apes want their t-shirts from, you know, someone there, great, we wanna make them with you, right? So we've got both sides of this. Some people that are extraordinarily brilliant in the space coming in, and then we've got folks you know, Mama Sue in, in South Dakota that doesn't know anything, but she knows she loves to support her community. And she wants to see it on, you know, once she sees it, she's addicted. That's very cool. So as, as we go from this idea to then making things real, Joseph, uh, in your case, as you work with AR, how do you see mass market adoption using those kind of technologies? How do you bring people? So yes, I mean, previously augmented reality before, two, three years ago, before Pokemon Go came out, it wasn't as, you know, nobody was thinking about it. And then when Niantic did the Pokemon Go, a lot of people started to see, okay, this can be used for fashion, this can be used for digital variables. We can create sustainability models upon it where you can actually purchase an NFT and get an augmented reality variable. And uh, after that, currently, as the market stands, I see a lot of big brands going into the space, especially in the web-based AR. Meaning you can open a camera on the Safari, Chrome, Brave, whatever it is, and you can directly view that NFT on yourself, on the on your feet, you can view it on uh, like a dress, uh, like a piece of a garment, or anything that you want, as well as accessories. And uh, this is where I see this at the moment being the best uh, in terms of it, because the technology is going more and more forward. We have a new artificial intelligence models being developed in place, and which will enable us to do like a one-to-one -one mapping of, I don't know, if a person is taller, if, if, and if a person is shorter, it will be directly correlated with augmented reality, so it will change based on the appearance of the person. That sounds incredible. Um, now, my experience, my brother, I brought something here. My brother um, gave me a gift a month ago for my birthday. It was a was a t-shirt uh, from a brand called MCQ. Sorry if there's anyone from MCQ here or anyone working with them. Uh, I didn't wear it because it was pink, so it wasn't uh, for, the, for the panel. But um, and the t-shirt came. He bought it to me because it said there was a blockchain token with t-shirt. So I read it and I, I was preparing for the panel yesterday. And I took the tag, it's a blockchain token. The first issue is, as you think about mass adoption, to me, the word blockchain cannot be there. Like, why should I scan it? Okay, blockchain token. And then I go there, and it says, every MCQ item has a unique item tag affixed to it outside. After purchase, tap the tag, tap your phone, one 
uh, an item page click on add to my collections. I, there's like five steps. I couldn't do it. I tried it for 30 minutes. I couldn't, I couldn't find where was the tag. So mass adoption in our crypto bubble, I think it's totally different than the real mass adoption, right? We need to make this easy. We need to be able to bring onboarding in an easy way. So uh, Joseph and, and Mark, what, what do you think is the best technology to do that, to make it really easy for people to understand and not saying, hey, there's a blockchain token, like, give me a reason why do I need to do this? Like, what is gonna do this uh, for me? Like, what do I, what am I getting out of it? Well, I mean, so let's look at the statistics, right? How many people in the United States collect NFTs? It's only a few hundred thousand, right? So if you're gonna try and ask everyone to do that, it's gonna be really tough. Uh, second, like how many people in the United States have MetaMask wallets, right? It's, 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 it's very small. So if you're marketing towards like the general population mass market, you have to abstract any type of blockchain tokenization away using something like Auth0 or some assignment, right? Um, so basically it has to be like, just like, it has to look like Web2, but have the back, the back end that's Web3 with the option of being able to, you know, pull your token out of the custodial wallet and stuff. Um, and that's the only way you're gonna get like full adoption because people know how to log in with their email. Nobody knows how to log, like most people don't know how to set up a MetaMask. He asked for my phone number. Like, it's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> to to, to, to so something, I don't know what's the, what's the value. Um, so, so, so yeah, how, how do you do it with AR? Yeah, no. I want to touch upon the point, not, not connected with augmented reality a bit, but we have a use case with the brand that approaches. It was a STEM-based STEM education platform, and they do STEM-based products on the physical. Uh, as a physical, you can connect little robots and stuff like that, and when you connect them, they work. They have a remote control car. So it's basically for children to learn about uh, how processors work, how wires work, and everything on, in between. And basically, they said to us, okay, we want to enter the NFT space but the targets are children. We want to teach them about NFTs. We want to teach them about metaverse and how, where is this all applicable? And uh, we came up with the task to strategize upon it. And this was the basically a truly, truly hard task to pull off in terms of customer journey, right? Because you're selling to the parents and the children and you need to, there's no, met, there shouldn't be no metamask involved. And basically the best principle that we found out was through, I mean, um, doesn't look like I'm chilling here, but uh, it was near blockchain. And uh, basically what we did, we purchased a physical kit uh, through their website, through their online store, and when you get the physical kit on your uh, home, you open, a Q op you open the physical box and there's a QR code placed on top of the box, inside, and when you scan the QR code, a near wallet opens up, and near wallet is a layer one solution, which enables you basically uh, you don't need the seed trace, you need an email and the password. And uh, with that email and the password, they are directly open the wallet and NFT is automatically dropped inside of the, of the wallet that they have created. And the seed trace was sent to their email address. And this was one of the most, one of the use cases that we did where we saw a lot of, a big customer retention and everybody was really happy about it. And they were really pleased to know how this works. And then later on we did tutorials, educational materials to guide them through the world of NFTs, what can be done with them, what can be traded, and stuff like that. Cool. So, so. I was going to just add to this. I think what you have to realize first is it's not about just adding something that's blockchain to a product. You've got to answer why. Why are you doing this? How is this making this easier, better for the consumer? What problem did you just solve by doing that? And I think right now we're seeing this glut of things that are being stuck on as additions, not contributions to actually improve your lives. And until companies really start tackling this approach to build a bridge that seamlessly and frictionlessly, friction, without friction, uh, can, you know, connects your metaverse, digital, and physical lives, it's just not going to work like that little coupon. So on that adoption, Michelle, like. How do you see the customer change, or how is it different from today and three or five years later? Where are we going? 
Uh, so the first thing is to talk about value. What is value? Is value getting access to goods? Is value for your consumer getting access to revenue? Or is it even just time? All right, so you know, I, I can only speak to my project because I know it the best. I don't want to speak to anybody else's. But if you look at my PFP above, um, what do you see? There's some artwork, it's a JPEG, but it's actually, I'm saving our consumers time. Most of our community women, women are notoriously underpaid and their time is overused. And if anyone wants to disagree with me, we can have a chat at the bar. <laughs> uh, so with that in mind, we created an NFT that would maximize your revenue. You don't have to go to work every day, that Mavion is going to work. Those glasses don't exist. But in about four months' time, they'll be all over the metaverse, and those royalties will come back to my pocket. And I can go and spend my time doing other things, probably making my kids' lunches, uh, and working and, and living life in either the digital or physical world in the way that I want to. So we really created this idea of turning a JPEG into a mini retail empire that drives generational wealth, particularly for women and their children moving forward. We did 27 days on the road in March, and we heard from women time and time again who we know are underrepresented here. You mentioned a few hundred thousand people are in NFTs, well, less than 10% are women. And they understand NFTs, they're curious about NFTs, but they can't find NFTs that they're interested in. And it's because their real life interests, like fashion, travel, family, health, wellness, and beauty, aren't here yet, but they will be. And so we want to make sure that you guys are ready and you've got the infrastructure, the education, you hear from people like these up here, so that you know what to do and you can find the NFTs that will add the most value to you. And your answers will all be different based on what is, you know, unique to your needs. So, as we move into the virtual world, like, we might be wearing Apple glasses, walking down Times Square, and I'm actually looking at someone wearing a Nike t-shirt and really he doesn't have any branded t-shirt physically. And our kids will be spending more and more time into this virtual world. They're going to be buying digital assets, not physical ones. So I'm going to say something about Joel Show, and I'm uh, looking forward to your opinion. But I think there might be some fashion brands that might disappear physically, literally, because there's the new customer in five, 10 years are only going to buy virtual goods. So what do we do with them? Like, what is the message that we send to them? is virtual. No. I mean, I think you still need to eat food, right? I mean, there was a conversation early this morning about how the one big company that, that started using and utilizing blockchain uh, was Walmart for food, right? But they never did it past that category. And I think it's, it's the consumer, us in the room, demanding transparency into what we put into our body, what we're putting onto our faces, what our kids are eating. It's, it's whatever you're passionate about, right? And I think that we still have physical goods. You know, we're still wearing clothes, we still have sneakers, and makers still want credit for those goods down the road. So it's a twofold thing, right? So whether it's the resale market, wanting to see where that item lives and always getting a percent of that sale, right, for Providence. There's, there's so many cases where blockchain and NFTs complement each other, right? And I love the idea of putting even that NFT and code into the garment and us thinking about how we take it from the beginning, from that seed or from that first part of the production and how it, it comes together to make something and how we can see it and decide for ourselves if we want to purchase it I don't know that the big three in manufacturing or marketplaces will survive down the road because they don't promote it past one or two categories. And I don't know if they ever will, right? I think, you know, there'll be new, there's new marketplaces, as we all know, that are entertaining what we're all thinking about here and what we've got to survive. Not everyone wants us to survive. We're fighting a lot. So, you know, I think it's exciting. Um, and if you want to share, Jonathan, what you're doing, since you've been entertaining us, so you got 25 seconds. <laughs> Next time, okay. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the, for the great insights. And uh, yeah, thank you.
Let's hear it for Jonathan, by the way. He got the least talking, but he's one of the smartest people on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.